Uh, thank you, doctor. It's a pleasure to be with you. I appreciate David uh, Feinwalks uh, introducing us, and I welcome the opportunity to offer my thoughts on on these problems. I have um, I've been a lawyer for fifty four years, and almost all of that has involved uh, policy and legal work in the healthcare field, uh, including early on in the early seventies uh, an exposure to and some involvement in dealing with the corporate practice of medicine prohibition. Uh, it is, and uh, as different people so far this morning have said, uh, it, sometimes explicitly, sometimes impliedly, this is this is sort of the cornerstone uh, of a uh, of a rescue mission. Uh, it is a, uh, as I'll mention more specifically in a moment, it is a viable legal doctrine uh, when people think about lawyers and think about. Uh, legal proceedings, uh, attention often turns to uh, let's sue them. Uh, I don't know that I, the first step in what I think has to be a methodical, medium term, uh, uh, multi level strategy to carry out this rescue starts with that lawsuit. I, I think, that in, therefore, that we should back up. I like to back up and put this in the context of our culture. All laws, all public policy uh, reflect cultural values and cultural beliefs. And uh, our medical profession, I, I think we should have comfort in and keep in mind our medical profession is the modern repository of the ancient cultural role of a community's healer. Uh, medicine, and as Dr. McNamara just noted, uh, an historic learned profession embodies certain qualities and traditions. The most precious of these qualities is the professional's sworn duty to act in the patient's best interest. This professional duty is known uh, to everyone. It's, it's implicit in the community view of medicine, and it's understood by the community. It's understood as such by your patients. Part of, I think, your frustration is that you're afraid that the people that you are caring for uh, are being misled in, in being, they're allowed to continue with this belief. They come to you with that belief. And part of the frustration is there's things happening to interfere with your delivering on that promise. Things that are presently out of your control, not because of a change of values in medicine. Um, this. And here's the key to success in the policy arena. This duty that you owe, this commitment to your patients is reciprocated. Uh, patients hold the medical profession. Uh, it holds each physician in high esteem. And that's the cornerstone of this effort working. Uh, and, and like all jurisprudence, our laws uh, reflect uh, values. And in that context, I, I want to point out, getting to the point of the announced topic, that the doctrine of the prohibition of the corporate practice of medicine uh, is alive and well, and I'd like to make three points on that. Uh, first, just to say that uh, the corporate practice of medicine uh, seems to be honored in its uh, in, by being ignored, but there has not been a decision that I know of uh, that has ever uh, disrespected it or renounced it. Uh, we've just drifted into a into our current situation. Uh, we've drifted quite far, and that makes the return trip d difficult. But we've sort of drifted into this situation. Uh, the doctrine is still alive and well. And the essence of the corporate practice of medicine prohibition is the legal recognition of a physician's duties to patients, and the doctrine prohibits any arrangement that even poses a mere threat to the fulfillment of these duties. Uh, the, the doctrine has evolved probably 50 different ways in 50 different states, and my focus in my experience has been in Minnesota. But the early cases and the early enforcement initiatives uh, all 
uh, related to uh, employment arrangements that they never got off the ground, frankly. So the courts were not looking at proven harm. They were talking about arrangements that because of their very nature posed a threat. And, and those types of arrangements were blocked, uh, even though it was pure speculation that if they were allowed to go forward, uh, it would produce harm. And in this regard, I have a paper. I don't know how people access that. Um, I've just tried to extract from various cases and attorney general's opinions, the rhetoric that is used uh, in law enforcement uh, in this. And, um, and it's, <laughs> it's like these things are being said today uh, without any touch with reality. It, they say that this doctrine is intended to prevent a middleman getting between the doctor and his or her patient. <laughs> well, <laughs> I realize the irony of that kind of rhetoric, but, uh, but that is the scope of this. On a, on a more granular analysis, these cases and the other law enforcement initiatives um, recognize and uh, seek to deal with the irreconcilable conflict of interest of a physician's duties to patients versus an employer's uh, duty of self-interest and a, a corporation's duty of generating profit for shareholders uh, or even other you might think of as legitimate duties that an, uh, that an entity, a hospital, a, a business corporation has to other community interests. The law recognizes the essential uh, relationship between a patient and, and his or her doctor and the uh, uh, essential uh, importance of preserving that. Um, the second thing I wanted to comment on uh, is that this, that is the doctrine. And I, and I guess I've already sort of tipped my hand on point two. I think it's still a viable doctrine. Uh, it's in place. It hasn't been discredited. It hasn't been overruled. In Minnesota, there have been recent uh, Supreme Court cases where this was sort of a side issue. And one justice in one case in a concurring opinion, thought that this doctrine ought to be uh, re-examined by the legislature. Uh, that was one judge out of seven, and nothing ever came of that. Uh, the courts acted in furtherance of the doctrine in those cases in recent years. Uh, so th it's still alive and well. I, as I said at the very beginning, I don't know that the first step in employing this as a tool in this rescue mission uh, is to start a lawsuit, but the uh, policy that is underlying this, this legal doctrine uh, and its widespread acceptance is, uh, I think, the beginning of a public policy change that will return our system to some uh, patient-focused uh, policies. Um, in, in this regard, by the way, <laughs> Uh, I'm pretty sure this has never been taken up. I believe that Roe v. Wade uh, includes a uh, discussion at any rate, maybe not a holding, that, uh, that a doctor's relationship with his or her patient is constitutionally protected. Just a comment, others probably laugh up their sleeves at that, but I, and we don't know where Roe v. Wade is gonna go, but. But I believe that our jurisprudence uh, embraces the sacred duty of a doctor to a patient uh, more than current um, practices would ever suggest. And finally, uh, Dr. McNamara alluded to learned professions. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the importance of success in this mission uh, is critical to the entire profession. I think, it's, I think it's important to our American culture, to society. Um, in the last analysis, uh, the professionalism of medicine 
uh, is important to everyone. Uh, and it's, uh, and if that's lost, the medical care, patient care, the treatment of patients, the, re the mitigation of injury and disease, everything we've put in place will crumble. This is not a lighthearted effort. Uh, it goes beyond uh, whether people can make enough money uh, whether they're happy in their work. I, this to me is, is the essence of our system. Uh, and as professionals, uh, while we're all distracted by day-to-day -day stuff like buying groceries and taking care of the kids and all the things that we worry about as human beings, but, uh, but as professionals, uh, we, we we are drawn to professions because of the essential qualities that we expect to experience. And they are, uh, there are elements that are essential to that intangible reward. Uh, the professionalism is based on mastery of the field, in this case, medicine, specialized areas in medicine. Uh, secondly, a sense of purpose. And third, uh, autonomy in doing what uh, you feel is best in fulfilling your uh, duties to others. Uh, to be a profession, to be a professional is to be other focused. It is to behave day in and day out above self-interest. And uh, without professionalism, uh, our whole system will crumble. And this is not just a political statement. Uh, I don't know how widely embraced or well known it is, but, uh, but the emerging, I think it's emerging, uh, understanding of behavioral psychology and behavioral economics uh, goes to the heart of this. It's proven in those social sciences th that allowing and fostering these elements of professionalism, mastery of the subject, um, uh, the development and execution of a sense of purpose and autonomy to behave as those in your conscience would dictate, those actually produce better results and a more efficient and more rewarding uh, uh, performance in an economic system. So this is not just uh, our feelings are hurt or somebody's getting in the way of us doing our job. This is actually interfering with the uh, performance, the proper performance, the effective performance of the profession. So I believe that this doctrine is alive and well. I believe it reflects societal values. And I think that it can be and must be an important part of the strategy to return to some semblance of priorities and normalcy. Thank you very much. I appreciate the chance to share my views.